Um, so hello and uh, welcome to the LVMA weekly webinar. Uh, we're revisiting the uh, forecast survey of earlier this year, which seems a long time ago. Um, I guess chairing the discussion, you've got myself, David Jolly, so uh, head of sales and market insight at uh, Anglo American Platinum. Uh, Rona O'Connell, you'll be hearing from as well, head of market analysis at INTL SC Stone. And Bernard Dada, who's a uh, senior commodities analyst at Natixis. And, and they were the two people that uh, I spoke to back in uh, January because they won prizes in last year's forecast. At that time, we talked about what the year ahead held. I think uh, it's fair to say none of us quite knew uh, how interesting times might be um, by the end of March and, and mid April. So it seems a good time to revisit, you know, um, essentially where we are, what I think in particular coronavirus, but not just the virus, but the response to it, the future outlook means uh, for the precious metals space. Um, and I, I guess with that, I don't know if either of you, uh, Rona or Bernard, would like to uh, just say a couple of words to start before I ask you any questions. Uh, thank you, David. Um, hello, David. Hello, Bernard. And hello to anybody who's listening to us. Um, it does seem like a long time ago, doesn't it? Uh, an awful lot has happened. Um, and obviously, the, the majority of the precious metals and most other asset classes, for that matter, have moved into different territory from what most of us were expecting, because by, by definition, the, the impact of the, the virus has, has been wholesale. I mean, it, it's affected. Um, I would set, set, um, sorry, I, I would certainly agree with what David has said thus far. Um, and I'm happy to talk about any or all of the metals according to how David would, would like to run the discussion. Cool, yeah, from, um, from my side, I would um, say that basically this has been quite a black swan event. Um, completely unexpected. I don't think anyone could have foreseen such an event. And what started off as a punctual issue, um, you know, just China centric, supposedly a two week lockdown, uh, we thought that would be like kind of a V shaped recovery has really unraveled into a global pandemic, which is causing all sorts of logistical headaches, um, gold included. And basically, I think people, Mark is more and more thinking of a U-shaped recovery uh, and the impacts um, of COVID. Um, it seems that the residual impact of COVID will be felt uh, now for, the, you know, at least a year, a year and a half, at least, uh, if not more, on on the economy. So, given the, the, the I think that's a fair description. I think given the uh, the size of the shock to demand side and the supply side of the economy, um, do you think it's fair to say that gold has performed in its uh, traditional role as a safe haven asset? In this case? And one of the questions which often gets raised is why has gold come down at a time of distress because it's supposed to be an insurance policy and shouldn't it be going up uh, and it's it's understandable for people who don't follow the markets in detail to ask that kind of question because gold coming down does indeed seem to be counterintuitive um, but certainly the way I would answer that question is that it always does. And there are two very good reasons for it. Well, one is to some extent philosophical. Uh, the other is more technical. And the philosophical element is that the reason why many professional portfolio managers will leave aside retail, uh, retail buyers and geopolitical risk. That's, that's, a, that's a different issue and not especially relevant for this particular part of the argument. Uh, one of the primary reasons why professional money managers would tend to hold gold in a portfolio is because it maximizes value adjusted risk and the risk reward ratios um, for similar level of risk, you enhance your reward and vice versa. And therefore, quite often you will find that 
when faced with distressed sales and potentially margin calls and so forth, that gold will be one of the key elements with which you can raise cash. And it does tend to, to be sold off in order to mitigate distress. And then generally speaking, those people who sold it off will come back in at a later stage and buy it. And this is pretty much what's happened this time around. It, ha it happens virtually every time. So that's the philosophical side. The technical side is quite closely wound in with that, thinking specifically of the equity markets. The vast majority of equity markets settle three days or longer after the date of the transaction. So that's T plus three or more, whereas gold settles in T plus two. So if you have exposure to the equities markets and you believe you're going to need cash to raise against margin calls, then you will have that money in your assets 24 hours before you actually need it because gold, gold settles that much more quickly. So gold is cash. And that, that explains, I guess, some of the downturn. Um, and it's performed pretty well, I think, in, in, in generic terms, you know, Certainly in dollar terms, the price seems pretty stable, actually, remarkably stable so far through coronavirus. But Bernard, do you think on the upside, does gold have relevance when we see a recovery, whatever shape that recovery may be? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I, I completely agree also with, with what Rona said. I mean, it, it is something that we've already seen back at the start of the financial crisis in 2008. We saw all of the month of September, the stock market going downwards and also gold prices were dropping at, at, at the time after the Lehman uh, crisis. So for exactly the reasons she, she, she described. Um, and as you're saying like, yes, if we do get a V-shaped recovery, you know, do we see gold continuing its, its, its rally? Um, I do think so. Um, first of all, this recovery would be kind of a technical recovery. So, in the near term. So it'll be, if you compare on a month on month basis, quarter on quarter basis, you're comparing with an episode where demand and supply was zero, practically zero. So you will see um, a strong recovery in, in, in that sense. But the other side of it, I think, which is important, which is the residual impact of, of, of COVID will be felt in, in, in two places one in employment figures and one would be the debt overhang on corporates so from the employment side we've already seen that the states uh we're talking about what is it um 22 million um 22 million people applying for um initial jobs uh, for initial job claims hitting 22 million which is something like the equivalent of 13, 15% unemployment right now. And it seems likely to reach 20%. So that happens very, very quickly, but it's not to say that the employment, when we're gonna see those levels improve with the bounce, the, the recovery phase won't be as quick when it comes to uh, re-employing people. So the problem with it will be that you will see uh, probably some uh, mortgage, uh, defaults on mortgages, defaults on car payments, and that could potentially create some headache uh, to some of the mortgage providers, to the, to the economy as a whole. Um, so there's that aspect of it. The other aspect of it will be also the debt overhang on corporates. So we're seeing that uh, their debt levels are increasing. We're seeing the downgrades, be it Ford, be it uh, other companies, already the ratings are, are going down. What that means is gonna create a higher cost of funding. It's gonna lead to less investment, more expensive, uh, yeah, higher cost of funding, uh, lower investments, lower growth, lower employment. And so, mm -hmm this combination of concerns um, from also defaults uh, from the high yield with the lower oil prices. Um, we're expecting something like a 9% default in summer from the high yield sector. So all, all that combination uh, of the employment and the corporates, I think is gonna keep gold prices up. Um, 
And also, we shouldn't forget that I don't think the Fed is going to raise rates anytime soon. Even if we get a bounce, um, it's probably going to be fighting inflation, uh, lo very low inflation with, with oil prices. So we're really surprised to, to see them keep um, uh, rates at such low, uh, close to zero. So I think in that context, that environment, that's why I see uh, gold prices you know, reaching heading towards 800. And then, given that, do you see uh, the environment as positive for other commodity prices, for the rest of the precious metals, um, heading heading forward into the recovery, where, as you say, we're going to have credit issues um, and real-world economic demand may be a little bit lower, but you have very, very low uh, interest rates and, and seemingly very little chance of those interest rates rising? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, there is this silver, which has underperformed so far. I think, you know, when you're talking about 60% of demand for silver, which is industrial, and we do get a technical bounce, as I'm mentioning, you know, we're restarting operations, so surely there is benefit in that. Uh, so we should get um, silver prices improve. The one which I would be slightly more skeptical on the demand side will be the automobile industry, um, which has had a really difficult time uh, this year. So be it PGMs, you know, I think palladium is like 80% auto catalyst demand, uh, platinum slightly lower than that, or even aluminium also very big exposure on the auto sector. The auto sector, I think in terms of demand, um, I don't expect to see pent up demand. There's always going to be that concern of a second wave uh, of a virus, which might put off some people from doing what is regarded as like an expensive uh, uh, purchase. But generally speaking, metals as a whole, also base included, should benefit from this rebound, if you want, once that happens. And, and Rona, if I can ask you, given what we say about gold as a commodity. What does it say when we see uh, sunny China having had a, a, a dramatic slowdown in footfall in say jewelry and sales and economic activity? And I think now India being more affected by coronavirus. And when those are the two big uh, end user markets, I guess, for gold, what does that say about what role gold really plays? I think at the moment we've, we've got two elements at play here. Well, one is the the longer term, whereby the re-rating of gold up by $250 odd dollars in the middle of last year, albeit over the course of three, it took about three months to do it, um, more or less snuffed out a lot of physical demand in India and China and various other parts of Southeast Asia. And so there was already a reluctance on the part of private individuals in, in those countries the Middle East, uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia between them account for something of the order of 70-72% of gold demand in normal circumstances. Now, obviously, the, these are not normal circumstances, um, but they, they are key in terms of physical demand. Uh, and as David says, looking at gold as a commodity, as opposed to looking at it as a currency, that, that, that is clearly tipping the balance away from an, an, a normal, stable, tolerance around market balance, if you like. Uh, so it takes it technically into a supply demand surplus before we start thinking about anything to do with professional investment. Um, so that's that's the longer term. There's been a reluctance there for, for some months. And I, I must say, I've, I've been incredibly surprised pre-virus pre at how long it was taking those markets to come back, because normally it's only a matter of weeks before private individuals get used to higher prices. Um, and this time around, it, it just didn't happen. Uh, which I suspect with hindsight is a combination not just of higher prices, but because we were also having creeping economic uh, instability and uncertainties anyway. So to some extent, certainly in China, the demand for gold sort of went onto the burner and it was seen more of, of a luxury than it would have been as, as a necessity. Uh, India is slightly different. India has a, a difficult philosophical view. Um, but I think the virus on top of that, um, that has meant obviously with lockdown, people have not been able to get out. Uh, in India, they still can't. 
Um, and there are the, basically, I think the, the outlook, the, the underlying view is that there are there are more important things to be buying at the moment than gold. And it, the, there will be pent up demand, and it will come back into the market. But it's obviously taking a very long time. Now, just on top of that, there's a couple of things I would add with particular respect to India. One is that we all talk about the the monsoon season from September and the big harvest in September October. Uh, there is another one. Uh, there are two harvest seasons in India, and one of them is now. And there is an awful lot of concern about the fact that this April harvest may fail completely because there is no one there's no one there to bring it in, and that could have quite a quite a knock on effect into the Indian economy as a whole, and particularly into gold purchases. Uh, the other area, though, which may have some some light on the horizon, is silver. Uh, India is the world's largest silver consumer. It has about 20% of, of total non-industrial. Um, and there's been very, very little interest there for, for the last four or five weeks or so because people have been able to get out to, to, to buy it. Um, but certainly the sentiment we're picking up from our offices in, in that area is that silver will likely be the much more the beneficiary than gold will when the markets finally start to return to normal and people can actually get out in, into, into the, the marketplace. Well, thank you. Yeah, if, I may, if I may add um, just a little point, which I think from historic, historical perspective was interesting, is that um, if you look at the financial crisis, so the first quarter of uh, 2009, so the, really the depth of it, we saw that uh, demand for gold had collapsed. It was at its lowest quarterly uh, level on since at least 2000, it was just under 600 tons. And um, clearly, the appetite got like completely cut in terms of jewelry demand, uh, consumer demand uh, at, at, at that time. And it's the same in a way now, whereby with that lockdown, we're going to see that consumer demand has dried up. We'd expect to see uh, some pent up demand once we, those markets open up again. Already, China's coming back on, on the market. It might not be a massive rally, but we, again, we're comparing with what it was equal to almost zero. And back in 2009, uh, second quarter, third quarter of 2009, we saw a big rally in, uh, in demand for gold. So I would suspect that we might see something similar in terms of consumer demand. We're starting from what is zero right now, uh, or at least a month ago, and we should get uh, more demand when we're comparing right now. So that should help support prices even more. Yes, indeed. In fact, in Thailand and Indonesia, uh, they are net sellers at the moment. So eventually that will turn around. This is because they're, they're, they're running for cash because they're concerned about um, extended lockdown periods. Yeah, and I guess one of the other things that's been very notable in the last few days is people uh, in the media saying, you know, uh, the coronavirus uh, itself and then the, the lockdowns from it will change how the future is, how people will work from offices and so forth. I don't want to go into that, obviously, I think that's really what we're here for today. But if you think of the longer term and the impacts from that, do you have any thoughts about either of you? Um, what it means on the supply side for, and I'm thinking gold particularly, but maybe silver too, where we have pretty strong prices today. We have uh, very, very low interest rates and, and looking like they might be low for a while, but we may have challenging uh, cash flow for some people. And we may have uh, challenging credit conditions as well. What does that mean for, for the supply side of gold, which is not something we, we touch on very often? Increased supply, I would say. Um, one thing that I've been musing about um, is what the official sector is going to do. Uh, there's there's two sides to this argument as well. Uh, one is that, generally speaking, um, official sector sales, if, if they are seen in circumstances like this, would probably upset the market sentiment um, because it would be interpreted correctly or otherwise as distress and maybe a little bit of panic. Um, but on the other side, uh, if there is constraint in the market, there's tightness in the market, um, then central bankers, and I believe it was Alan Greenspan way back in the late 1990s, um, before the CBGA went into accord, went into um, 
was, was signed off, uh, that central banks would, would stand in the gold market as lenders of last resort in order to make sure that the markets remained orderly. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see what kind of role the central banks play, should, should they need to, should, should there be problems on the supply side. From, from a mining standpoint, obviously, David, you, you, you are very closely in touch with what's happening in South Africa, so I will, I will definitely defer, defer to you on that one. But it, it is, it's interesting to see that in a lot of countries, mining, and particularly refining, is being deemed as, quote, essential. Um, obviously, South Africa has, has taken a slightly different view. Uh, in parts of Latin America, um, closures have been imposed, Mexico in particular, and then obviously there, there are problems in Chile and Peru. So there is potentially a structural problem with the supply side, uh, which would take time to, to, to mitigate, uh, not least because once, particularly if it's a deep mine, goes under care and maintenance, it's not like an aluminium smelter. You can't just flick the switch and have it coming back on again. It takes time. Yeah, from, from my side, I would add, uh, I think, looking at CapEx cuts. So I would suspect that from an M&A perspective, the gold mining would be attractive right now, or precious metals mining silver and gold. Uh, but we have seen that in the rest of the mining uh, side of things, base metals specifically, over the past two weeks, there has been some announcements of CapEx cuts. So like Rio, quite a bit, I think 2 billion, if I'm not mistaken. Codelco also, uh, Norsk Hydro earlier, I think had uh, said that they would be reducing also some of their CapExes. Um, so basically what that would mean eventually is that you, on a longer term perspective, you, you, you in theory, basically seen how severe those capex cuts uh, will be but in theory you could get a uh, lo lower output um, that's that's about it okay and then one final question uh, for either of you really uh, whoever wants it first is when we see something i've never seen before certainly the efp exchange of physical so there was the futures price and, and the ingot price um, Blowing out to sort of record, as far as I'm aware, record levels. What does that say to you about how the market is working? And, and uh, about does that mean anything to us other than some traders make some money in the short term <laughs> and some losing it? Um, to some extent, well, to a very large extent, uh, this is a function of reduced airline flights, obviously. Um, Gold, not, not so much silver, um, because it, it's lower unit value by weight, but certainly gold and the PGMs, uh, the majority of that transport is, is airborne, uh, generally in cargo and passenger flights. And obviously with more than 90% of the global airlines, or global airline capacity now grounded, uh, this has been the logistical issue. Um, it wasn't helped, of course, when three of the big Swiss refineries were, were asked to close down for a fortnight. They're now back with permission to run it up to 50%. So that, that exacerbated the decision. Um, but it, it's flights that's the real problem. Um, and just getting the metal from, from the right place to, to the next right place in, in one easy step is, is not proving easy at all. Um, as far as the EFP specifically with respect to COMEX is concerned, um, I think there's been a little bit of panic there, to be perfectly honest. I see the, open, the most recent open interest figure that I could get hold of was for the middle of last week. And that was about, from memory, it was about 1,520 tonnes, I think. It's like 1,500 and something. And now, generally speaking, um, it's very unusual, even for as much as 5% of open interest ever to be delivered against when, when the relevant contract expires. It's very unusual. Um, but what has happened? is that obviously the, the EFP, it, it started with respect to the April contract, now it's June. Generally speaking, as a contract comes towards expiry, the, the banks prefer to be short the EFP, i.e. short the futures, um, as against the, the, the long side for the physical. Um, and it, it looked to me as if it basically, it just became a seller's market, to be perfectly honest, because uh, at that point, we had something like 300 tonnes of gold in Comex inventories. We've now got coming up to 600. Um, and that's just over the space of the past fortnight. So they've, they've actually managed to sh ship it. So, so some, somehow they've got around the logistical issues. But if we see the normal pattern of delivery, or more accurately, non-delivery, then this, this looks to me like a panic, to be perfectly honest. Um, I, I, as far as I can see, the, the metal that would normally be delivered is already there. 
Um, from, my, from my side, what I would just add uh, is that probably from all the metals that um, metals or commodities that I cover, it, it's what happened with gold was uh, in terms of logistics, it's, it's probably, you know, in terms of COVID related uh, logistical um, issues that, that that virus has created, probably gold has surprisingly is the one to have witnessed the most um, swing or in, in that effect, you know, as Rona was saying, the airline side of things, the refinery side of things, um, and to see that impact that it had on the EFP, as opposed to other, let's say, metals, uh, copper, etc., we didn't see that much of an impact. Okay, yes, lower production from um, South America, but it's not like uh, prices have... Um, gone through the roof. Um, we saw also covid related issues in South Africa um, in terms of mining. So that obviously created a logistical issue in that sense. But with gold like that, I was very surprised to see that the whole chain, um, how it's been um, impacted. I would say probably, again, from all the commodities that I cover, it's, it's the one whose chain from A to Z has, been, has seen the most uh, commotion. Okay. Um... Um, given I'm uh, sort of chairing this session, I'm going to skip over the silver um, as my prerogative and, and ask you a question about platinum group metals. Really, if we look at gold, which is you know your quintessential precious metal, um, and an economic you know uh, asset in many ways, wide um, uh, production, so production from, from all around the world. And then you take the, the platinum group metals, which are certainly in their uses largely, not exclusively, but often industrial in their uses, and the production is much more concentrated. Uh, what does that mean in the, uh, in, in the current coronavirus world? And then what does it mean in, in, in the uh, world in six months' time? Well, Bernard has already alluded to the automotive sector, um, which obviously is a key um, for both platinum and palladium, and, and rhodium for that matter, but that's a little bit perhaps beyond the remit for today. Um, what we saw in the latter part of 2019, which was one of the key drivers in palladium's roaring bull market last year, obviously it's been a longer than just the one year, but the specific period from around about the middle of last year did look to us as if a lot of the buying that was coming out of China could well have been stopped, I'm talking about palladium rather, rather than platinum, could well have been stockpiling ahead of the new emission control legislation which is due to come into effect in 2023. Now that sounds like a long time but it's actually really only a couple of years in terms of retooling and recalibrating and the design of the new catalysts in order to meet the, the new limits. Um, and for the purposes of palladium in particular, the, un, the unburned hydrocarbons is one of the, one of the key sets of gas, uh, noxious gases, obviously not, not the only one. Um, but that new legislation cuts, cuts in half the permissible level of emission of unburned hydrocarbons. And the nitrous oxides and the um, carbon monoxide uh, they are being cut by between, I think it's 28% and 40%, depending on which gas you're looking at. So that that points to an awful lot more palladium. And it did look as if that was industrial stockpiling. So if you add that to the fact that the automotive sector is on its knees and it's going to take a long time to recover, because as Bernard says, th those are big ticket items and that, that's something that's going towards the bottom of the shopping list. Uh, then that potentially takes some of the heat out of the palladium market, which we which we might otherwise have expected. Um, there is a little bit of liquidity coming back into the market, um, but for the, for the time being, obviously, um, we're, we're we're looking at we have been looking at tightness. Um, again, this is largely to do with airlines over, over the last six weeks or so ago. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll, sorry, I'll start again. We have been looking at some tightness related to the transport logistics, same as with gold. Uh, um, that, that has impinged to some extent on the level of offtake that we might otherwise have expected. But with the auto sector not looking as if it's going to recover in a hurry, uh, then the massive long-term bull market in palladium, I think, is probably a thing of the past. 
Um, what I would add from my side is just the near-term uh, outlook is my concern would be with South Africa now. So when we saw that big drop in palladium prices that was coming hand in hand with, um, sorry, when we saw the rally from the latest drop that we saw in palladium, that came hand in hand with the announcement by South Africa that they would be stopping um, mining operations. And so my concern in the near term would be seeing the combination of so South Africa coming back online. So we already know that 50% of the mines are coming back online. That takes some time. Um, but at the same time, you know, we look at the latest data coming from Europe in terms of passenger car registrations that came out on Friday. And we're seeing car registrations for the first quarter of this year is down 25% this year and 55% in March, down 85% in Italy. Um, and, you know, it does seem when you look at the lockdown period, we're talking about reopening probably mid-May in Europe, um, France, etc. So probably not before June to get back to more normal, slightly more normal levels of, of um, auto sales. But at the same time, probably by then South Africa would, 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 be, would be back properly online. So my big question or big concern would be do we see another big dip in the near term in uh palladium prices yeah it's interesting it's interesting to tell me i one that takes spent spent a lot of my time trying to work out the, the balance between uh, the economic world and the real world and i think that's the challenge for platinum green metal and it's a challenge for silver as well um which is why I think we always start talking about gold first, get the economic discussions out of the way. Um, with an eye on the time, I think we might uh, call it a day there. Um, I'd like to thank both uh, both of you, Rona and Bernard, for your uh, time. And also for reminding us that it's, uh, first up, this is a complex situation, it's a changing situation. And I don't think any of us forecast quite what would happen, or indeed know what will happen beyond that. Um, and that it's also, I think, a reminder for everyone that it's also humanitarian as well as uh, and, and a trading outcome as well. So, uh, with that, I, I wish you a good day for the rest of the day, and I hope you get at least um, some air and some sunshine wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you.